All right, here we go. A great episode of It's Not Soup. Going to be put in the books today. Uh, we're missing Chris Bishop as he sits at the uh, LVR board, making sure that the LVR is doing everything they're supposed to be. Um, what a great week, Keith. Um, holy mackerel, we've had some great stuff happening. We're almost on the big switch, right? Um, just to give you up to date, everything has to be voted through. Everything had to be out of committee by last Friday. Anything that was not out of committee and voted to be moved back to the floor is dead. Uh, so the bills, yeah, technics. Well, yeah, there's nothing really ever dead, but you know they can bring life into it when they when they want to. But supposedly, without any shenanigans, um, if it's not voted on the committee and back to the floor by the 25th. Uh, then it doesn't switch over to the next house. And if it didn't switch over to the next house, technically, as Keith technically. So boldly advised, that it's not spo it's supposed to be dead. Um, one of the bills that has did not get a hearing in committee um, was the one for us to be self-funded. Uh, so unfortunately, that one technically is dead. Well, um, fin finance ones... Finance ones are, are exempt from those. Oh, they are? Okay, so, good. Uh, anything that's attached to the budget, anything that's uh, finance related, that's why sometimes these bills that are technically dead all of a sudden come up with some kind of a monetary and they're technically undead. But yeah, so that, that one, uh, the, those, uh, the ways and means and finance ones are, um, uh, I think exempt is the right word, but they're, they're not, they're, they're, they don't have those kinds of deadlines. Okay, so it might be on life support. Let's put it that way. Maybe I think we're good. I think we're in good shape. I haven't heard anything otherwise, but maybe, maybe, uh, 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 you know, it, it, those things are always going to be last minute stuff. So they get through the budget stuff. Yeah. So, the, the, so the big switch. So, so let's let's explain the big <laughs> switch. Um, with that, what happens on the twenty fifth, Keith? If if things aren't heard on the floor and voted on. Yeah, they are. They are according to the rules. Um, they are. They are died. According to the rule, there's no no further action um, that can be taken on those bills. Um, just like you know, they so they've got you know, preset dates. Has to come out of committee. Has to go to the other side of the house. Has to be approved by the when, once it goes to the other side. It has to be out of committee by a certain date and on the floor by a certain date. And that's just to ensure that the 120 day. Um, session is is kept to and, and what happens a lot of times um, and this is where uh, I don't want to say inexperience but this is where inexperience of leadership comes in um, and, and they don't know how to close down a, a, a session as effectively as some of the old timers I mean when I was there you had the, the Senator Raggio's and, and the Joe Dini's and they knew how to shut down a, a session it usually involved a couple of trips to Jack's bar across the street but they got the damn sessions closed by on time, so um, they knew how to do things, and uh, that's that's sometimes not the case here. Again, that's not a criticism; it just is a fact of life. Yeah, because it's look, look. There is a lot of nuances that happen at the legislature um, between the leadership of the Senate, the leadership of the Assembly. Um, they've got to get their act together so that everything runs smoothly. And what happens in the, the big switch is what I'm calling it, right? When the assembly bills go to the Senate and the Senate bills go to the assembly, um, some things get dropped. Uh, some things, it's another opportunity for things that someone thinks is a bad bill on either the Senate or the assembly side to have things not come out of, the, out of their desk drawer. Um, you know, and, and here's what happens a lot of times, Tom. People, you know, they go one party rules. Well, you, you would be surprised, if not shocked, at the rivalry between the Senate and the Assembly, period, but then between the leadership of the Senate and the Assembly. And so here's what happens a lot of times a Senate will, member will be upset with an Assembly member, and they'll kill one of their bills. And so, you know, of course, just being politics, what's the Assembly member got to do? Well, of course, he's got to kill one of their bills. Is, and we've been caught up in that a couple of times. And so that's one of the things that, that our great lobbying team on the ground is, is really working more than anything is the rivalries between the two. 
one bill being held hostage, that means three bills are being held hostage on the other side, which means then seven bills get held on the other side. It just goes from there. So that's that's really one thing that can be good, but it can be also be bad too. Right, and, and with all the bills that we've seen floated around, it may be okay that everybody gets upset at each other and starts holding bills because it exactly. wasn't there. You know, and, yeah, and, things and that's, that's where the experience comes in. Yeah, the, yeah. the experience of fanning those flames sometimes. So, yeah. So, let's but, yeah, I think about, by and large, we're in good shape on a lot of our stuff. And that, and that just I, goes to where we're coming from on uh, all the things that we did in the interim to, to work through a lot of these things the landlord tenant, uh, the, the rent controls, all those bills that we worked that we were criticized for uh, by those that don't understand the, the process. Uh, we're, we're really looking good because now you're starting to see some of these more draconian landlord tenant, more draconian um, uh, rent control things starting to slow down and, and lose traction in the session because we could point and say, look, we're supporting that. Yep. And you probably saw it on the news, right? Um, the culinary union testifying for um, a certain bill for the rent control bill or rent stabilization. Uh, as they want to call it, because that apparently hold better than rent control. Um, you know, we were at that. And it's funny how I want to talk about the news story for a bit, for a second. So you may have seen the news story. You saw Papa George uh, talking. Um, and what you didn't see just out of the camera frame was Keith and I sitting there chomping at the bit to be able to talk in opposition to it. And, of course, they don't show any of that. Um, but they show Papa George talking about how, you know, rent control is the, uh, is the end all be all for our troubles. We all know that we just need more housing, right? Rents have come down. Uh, housing values have come down. Um, the market is sort of settling down from where it was over the pandemic, right? That, that was all these increases were due to the fact that we had almost two years of nothing happening. No building, uh, people were not paying rent, people weren't paying their mortgage, you know, all of that stuff, you know, we had to reset. And with that reset and everybody being able to move from house to house, either renting or buying, that increased the, the demand and we had no extra supply. And henceforth, we get, end up getting, you know, increases that were astronomical. And I, I'll be the first to say that rent went up astronomically. Uh, yes, values of homes, in my opinion, went up astronomically. Um, are we seeing some settling down? Absolutely. Will we continue to see some settling down? Um, I, I, I think so. And, you know, and rightfully so. Um, for those that are trying to get into the market and for those that, that saw huge increases, um, you know, you may not have such a huge increase when you go to sell your house. So you know, talk, you know, all legislation is unfortunately uh, looking at the back back end. Very, very, very few times is it forward looking. It's usually looking in the rearview mirror, and that's just the nature of legislation. Um, well, I feel their frustration. You know, every example cited uh, that they cited was from a major uh, apartment complex. And yeah, I'm bashing apartment complexes owned by multi-billion-dollar international hedge funds. Because that's where the problem lies. It's not the mom and pop Nevada homeowner, and I and I will bang the bed, bang bang the desk as, as many times as I want. I got my new presence ring. I'll bang the desk every time when I say that the mom and pops are being treated the same way as a multi-billion-dollar hedge fund. And that's not right. Um, those that own four and less are not the problem. They're talking through these things with their tenants. They're not kicking them out. They're not putting thirty percent increases in their rent. Um, they know that the most expensive time is when that house sits vacant. Um, and, and that's the real problem. And until we address it, we're going to continue talking about this for the next 30 years. We've yep. got to address that. We've got to pull the Band-Aid off and, and start treating mom and pop Nevada homeowners differently than we're treating hedge funds. And, and l l let's face it, um, it's great political theater to be able to talk about what has happened, right? Rents have gone up. You know, forget about the fact that it's going down, values went up. Forget about the fact that it's going down. They want to talk about what has happened and legislate to that when we really don't need the legislation. We just need more homes. 
Yeah. Right? Well, we need more homes, but we, we, we also can't let that happen again. You know, we can't, yeah. we can't let, if we want, if we want, uh, the, the rent and the tenants to be having one choice and that is a 2000 door complex, then, then we're on the right track. But if we want to encourage mother, mother and fathers to be uh, able to rent their house, um, and, and mom and pops could get lucky and, and be fortunate in life and, and get another house. Um, so they think it maybe rent out two more houses and, and build equity and build wealth, sustainable generational wealth for themselves. Um, then, then we need to rethink about how we approach these things. Until then, it's going to be a, a real tough row for Nevada homeowners uh, to, to become, to become uh, you know, even close to being generationally wealthy. Yep. All right. So let's go to um, three uh, SB three seventy one, which is the home rule um, <laughs> for affordable housing. Now, this bill wanted to give the counties and local governments the ability to push rent control as they see fit. And for those that don't know, we're in a Dillon Law uh, state, which means the county and local governments can only do what the state legislators provide them the ability to do. Uh, so that apparently somebody was thinking it was a great idea to give local rule on rent control, which would mean the city of Las Vegas could have this rule. The county could have that rule. Um, you know, North Las Vegas could have their rule. And just like the issues we're having with short-term rentals, right? Everybody has their own rules. Centers could have their own rules. Um, no one's going to know uh, what's happening and what's the right thing to do. So yeah, the same thing happened with short-term rentals that they're trying to do with, uh, with, with uh, rent control and affordable housing measures and all that. And then we see how that turned out. And that's been our argument this time is, is you know, it was led, led by the former governor, um, Sisolak, who, who said that it, he felt it was up to the, the locals, uh, which we disagreed with. Um, but they're kicking the can down the road. They don't want to be the, the decision makers, so they're kicking the can to the municipalities. That's all they're doing with this. Um, you know, so I, I think it's, it's a leadership role to stand up and say, no, that's not the Nevada we want. We don't want to have um, four different rules down in Southern Nevada, as an example, um, uh, when we, we need one. Um, and recognizing that the state is very different, um, we could still craft a policy um, just like we have with the bills that we supported. So obviously we're in opposition to that one. Okay. And then um, SB 381, which is the landlord, uh, you know, charging for anything relating to habitable conditions. Uh, we've done a lot of, uh, of assisting drafting the wording in that so that it makes sense, right? Yeah. Uh, when it first came out, it was, you know, the landlord was responsible for everything, including a, a plugged up toilet. Um, we've gotten some of the, the wording, thanks to you and Carrera and everything they've done uh, to. Sort and of again, that, that started with uh, every example they had. Every example was from an apartment complex. And, and there are there are according to state law, there are there are, there are certain things that you have to have um, in order to be able to rent a home. You have to you have to supply as a landlord certain things. You know, yeah. doors, windows, those kinds of things, right? You know, and, and plumbing and HVAC and all those kinds of things. And so, you know, the, the, the issue became, and they were very workable with this. They understand the both sides of it is that, you know, what, what happens if the tenant damages something purposely? Well, then that's been addressed. And, and uh, But there were, were some that were charging for everything, no matter what the repair was, the requirement of uh, air conditioning goes out in July. Well, they were charging on top of their rent. So uh, I could see both sides of it as well. Yep. So, so well, as we wrap this one up, I, I just want to say I, I would be amiss if I didn't say thank you for the hundreds, if not thousands of messages I got from last week's, yeah, <laughs> the, in their words, not my top best soup episode ever. I thank you all. Um, I am humbled by your praise and uh, hopefully, uh, being saddled with Mr. Blanchard uh, didn't uh, dim the lights this week. <laughs> I just want to say, Tommy, we had fun doing this. Hopefully it shows. I know a lot of other people have uh, been sending stuff and we have a good time doing this. So thanks for your efforts to do this. And I think it was, it was a great way of getting 
uh, more of the personality, right? You can read the advocate, which I highly suggest. Um, yep. But this provides, I think, some of the background of what's what's not able to be put in print because otherwise it book every single week. So with yep. that, um, I want to thank you for all you've done. I know it was a busy week. Uh, Azim Jessup was working hard and, and testifying up in Reno last week. Yep. This week is going to be an interesting one as we get to the uh, must pass to uh, from the floor. So there'll be a lot of floor time um, for those that don't understand what floor time is. It's for the floor uh, of the Senate and the Assembly to pass the bill. And we'll go until next week. Remember, it's getting pretty close. We, the ingredients are all there. Um, now I can smell much, the pot, but it ain't know, soup much, yet. How much stuff we put in the pot, it all depends on what happens with the big switch. And uh, we look forward to talking to you next week on another episode of It's Not Soup Yet.